Thanks very much. It's great to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to another talk in the summer series. Uh, quick show of hands, how many of you have been to at least one other summer series talk? All right, if you've been to two, keep them up. Three. Oh, we got some good veterans here. Okay, let's go up to five. How about 20? <laughs> There's a clue, there haven't been 20 talks yet, so you can't. Anyway, I'm, I'm really glad, and, and I think uh, those of you who've been to several of these will agree that these just keep getting better, and there's a body of knowledge coming out of these that's, that's really interesting and inspiring to all of us. And you may know that here at Ames, we embrace diversity, we embrace um, innovation, and we are looking for the subject matter in these talks and the series and in the way we do our work to really inspire that. And I think that you're uh, going to see that we've, we're going to be exploring some new territory today and a fascinating talk given by Dr. Temple Grandin um, on the subject of helping different kinds of minds solve problems. Dr. Grandin has a bachelor's degree from Franklin Pierce College, also a master's at Arizona State and a PhD from the University of Illinois and is currently a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. The, uh, she's also the uh, uh, creator of an award-winning film and is an author uh, that, of an acclaimed book, and I think that is available outside for those of you interested in, in reading more about that. Um, Dr. Grandin will be describing different methods of thinking in pursuit of fostering better communication. And I'm really looking forward to this subject, and I think that we'll all find it an inspiration. So welcome again to all of you, and let's give a good round of applause and welcome to Dr. Temple Grandin. It's really great to be here today. Got a lot of things to talk about. I'm sorry, I'm just getting over a cold, so I hope I don't get too hoarse. I think I'll give a little background about myself. I was one of the kind of kids that didn't do well in school. And one of the things that really turned me around was a super good science teacher. And he actually was a NASA space scientist who worked on spacesuits, so Mr. Bill Carlock. Um, he was not an accredited teacher. You know, you don't need to do all the school bureaucracy stuff. And he showed me all kinds of interesting projects and got me interested in studying. I can't emphasize enough the importance of showing kids interesting things. And you do a lot of interesting things here. You need to start putting up a whole bunch of YouTube videos. Okay, I just talked to this guy here, and um, he uh, does uh, computer graphics over the airplane wing. That's cool stuff. Let's make a YouTube video just out of that. Because you got a lot of cool stuff, but it's hard to navigate the web page. You know, just put it up as, um, as YouTube videos, a lot of keywords so people can find it. Because I travel all around the country, and there's a lot of kids in a lot of different places that get labeled ADHD or autistic or whatever. Well, you know, the geeks and the nerds come here. And the problem we've got with the autism diagnosis is it goes all the way from a lot of scientists here at NASA and to people at Google and other companies to somebody who can't dress themselves. All has the same label. I just read a recent paper that a little bit of autism genetics is linked to intelligence. You see, things are not all so simple. If you got rid of all the autism genes, we'd still be in caves, because who do you think made the first stone spear? <laughs> now, it's been very interesting for me learning how my mind is different. When I was young, I used to think everybody thought in pictures the same way I think. I just assumed that everybody thinks the same way. Now, if we have an understanding of how different kinds of minds think. I'm going to show you how they can work together. Because to have good projects, you need to have different ways of thinking. But the first thing you have to understand is that, yeah, some people do think different. Let's look at some of the common conflicts. The techies hate the suits. <laughs> oh, that's a big one. And I can tell you I'm not big on the suits either. But there is a point where maybe you do need a few suits to keep things organized, because maybe the techies aren't all that organized. The people in the field think the academics are stupid. Well, you need to have both. Then you get into, some scientists say, if you don't do a controlled experiment, you, that's animal science, we're taught, 
If you don't have a controlled experiment, you don't have science. And I used to say to my professor, well, what's astronomy then? <laughs> and then the artists don't get along with the accountants. They can't stand each other. And then in my field, you got the ethologists who study the animal in the natural environment versus the behaviorists, put the rat in a Skinner box, put him on a variable reinforcement schedule, and you've got a slot machine in Vegas. <laughs> That's how those work. And I don't play slot machines. I can't think of something more stupid than being a rat in a Skinner box. <laughs> Not a very smart thing to do. OK, some of the conflicts we have are silly. If you work for the digital US government digital service, do you have to wear a tie? No, you don't. But maybe a totally ripped up um, t-shirt with a bunch of bad words on it probably would be a good idea not to wear that. You know, we fight, what is science? Well, one of the things that's a big part of science is observation. You get a Pluto trip. You go out there to explore. Exploring is a basic human value. You know, three-year-olds at the airport explore. I get lots of time to watch people in the airports. I mean, a three-year-old will find that tensilator rope, you know, those little posts, a little tape that goes between them, really interesting to unfasten and just pull back and forth. You know, a three-year-old will think that's just wonderful. That is exploration. It's a basic thing. And there's lots of fields where you have to observe first. I've often wondered, what's the control for the Hubble Space Telescope? Maybe I pointed at the ground. Maybe it was a spy satellite originally, so maybe it has a control. I don't know. OK, I learned that my thinking was different when I started asking people about how they think. And I asked a speech therapist one time, think about a church steeple. How does it come into your mind? And she goes, pointy thing. I go, pointy thing? I have no pointy thing in my mind. I only have specifics because my concept is based on a whole bunch of different church steeples. Then I could classify them, cathedrals versus chapels. Now, this is probably the most important slide I've got. And I've got to have a drink of water before I can explain this slide. I am a photorealistic visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture, an object visualizer. Couldn't do algebra. I'm seeing a lot of smart kids that can't do algebra. And the mistake that's being made is they're not letting them go on to geometry and trig. Because there are students that can't do algebra that can do geometry, trig, and calculus that have been in physics departments that have not graduated from high school. Then you have the pattern thinker. This is your engineers, the people that figure out the trajectory of the orbits, things of this sort. They think in patterns. These little kids often have trouble with reading. Then you have the verbal thinker. Then you have some people that learn so much better auditory. You know, they're, they're auditory thinker. And these different kinds of minds can complement each other. Now, what are some of the characteristics of visual thinking? And even some of the pattern thinking. It's bottom up, not top down. Concepts are made of specific examples put in categories. That's how I think. Also, as a visual thinker, I notice little details. It's also sensory based. It's not word based. Also, a lot of people get labeled with autism and dyslexia and other things like this. It's associative, not linear. So it tends to be very creative kind of thinking. And in the very first work I did with cattle, I noticed the animals would be afraid of a lot of little visual things, like there'd be a car parked next to a facility. There'd be a little piece of plastic or a little piece of string. <coughs> <coughs> Some little thing that most people don't notice. And you get rid of those distractions, then the animals walk right through the facility. So looking at visual detail, Think about cattle out there in their natural environment back when they were oryx. That's the ancestors of cat. OK, eyes on the side of their head. They graze. They can look all around for something that might eat them. So they're very aware of little visual change. OK, how many people here saw that that animal was locked onto that sunbeam like radar? How many people saw it? Oh, we're doing horrible here. <laughs> you know who does really well on this? children. I show this slide, the same exact slide to children, 10 and 12 year olds in 4-H and FFA, you know, showing their animals. 
and maybe a third of them will raise their hands. Children tend to see it better because they tend to be more visual thinkers. Look at how the horse and the zebra have an ear on each other, and then the other ear is pointed at me. Try to train people. Be better observers, observer of detail. Lots of scientific discoveries are serendipity. Did you know that Viagra was an accidental finding? <laughs> and that major classes of drugs like antidepressants and mood stabilizers were accidental discoveries. Lithium was originally a salt substitute. Then they found out it had a weird side effect. <laughs> That's how it was discovered. And how did they figure out what Viagra did? Well, the guys didn't want to give the experimental heart medicine back. <laughs> and that's how that was discovered. I'm serious. That's serendipity, because a scientist asked a question. And I always get asked about getting afraid of slaughter. And I'm not going to show any slaughter pictures. But if you actually want to figure out how some of these things work and some things I've designed, you can go look up beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin. And NASA needs to be getting a lot more video lessons put up online that teachers, like in Louisiana and other low-income areas, can look up and find a really interesting thing on airflow over the airplane wing from the guy that was told to get back in the further back row. And I said, I want to talk to this guy. He wanted to sit up closer to me. Well, I think he's got something interesting. And how do we get through all the bureaucrats to get these videos up there? I remember President Kennedy's speech. I was really inspired by that. I'm a child of the 50s. I worshiped the astronauts. You know, and it really upsets me, you know, things are, you know, running out of money. You know, expl exploration's really important. I'm glad the New York Times put uh, Pluto on the, on the front page. But I get this little science magazine called Science News. It makes me very upset to see hearing aid ads all over it. You mean only old people read science news? <laughs> it's a wonderful little magazine. It ought to be in every elementary school library and high school library. You know, we've got to get young people interested in science. Now, give you some more insight into visual thinking. It's really important to train cattle to handle both to a man on a horse and a man on foot. Because think about it. A man on a horse is a different picture than a man on foot. They're very specific in how they think. Got to train them to both. And there's one of my facilities. And when I, I could test run equipment in my head, I thought everybody could test run equipment in their head. I had a chance to go into one of the labs and I saw you know, a mouse cage. Well, you need both the engineering kinds of minds and the visual thinkers. In fact, years ago, I actually came up with an idea for a rat cage in space, kind of a cylinder with grids on it. So the rat could um, you know, hold on to it no matter what position he's in. But I thought everybody could visualize things. I didn't know that my thinking was different. Now I've been working on some new simpler designs. I did some of the first research on cattle temperament. And I found that calm animals gain more weight. So for the last 20 years, people have been selecting for calmer and calmer cattle. And I can handle them in a more simplified facility. They're not as wild as they used to be. Give me a key word, like shoes. Well, and then I see um, that's a childhood shoe right there. I guess um, they had to go through these slides for the, you make sure they didn't violate copyrights. And I did have a picture of some little red Mary Janes. And I used to have to wear those with awful little scratchy petticoat dresses that I hated. <laughs> well, on that slide, I guess we couldn't use that slide. So we went right to the much better memory. We did not have those kind of socks, though, in the 50s. <laughs> you see, this is details. And when I worked with an HBO movie, I was really into details. You've got to remember, 70s, there were no backpacks. And there were no Nike-type shoes. It was this type of shoes. OK, now that's a nice classic 50s or 60s picture right there. It makes me happy that young people today are liking our fashions. So how did I get from shoes to mud puddles? Now, i got to show you the real thing, because I had to take that slide out, the Ariat boot. And I remember I was jumping through some mud puddles at a university where I was giving a talk. So that's how I got from this kind of shoe that I'm going to just have to show you, just regular, and mud puddles. You see how it is associative. 
<coughs> really sorry about the coughing, but I went to the side so you can edit that out. <laughs> now, there's real scientific evidence that there are two different kinds of visual thinkers. There's an object visualizer like me, and then there is the pattern thinker. This PET meta-analysis is a really interesting study, and it shows how there's different parts of the brain are involved. My book, The Autistic Brain, uh, which is, well, is available out here, or you can buy it on Amazon or somewhere else. Maybe I'm not supposed to be uh, talking about commerce. <laughs> yeah, I love Click and Clack, the Tappet Brothers, and they talk about their shameless commerce department. <laughs> but what I'm interested in is getting information out there. You do a lot of cool stuff, all these wind tunnels and things like this. You need to be putting that up on YouTube videos, individual YouTube videos. Don't bury them in your impossible to navigate website. <laughs> they need to be put up as individual videos with a lot of the good keywords on there. And then the social media people need to just promote them to the schools. That's what you need to be doing. We got to show kids interesting stuff. Now, everybody thought I was a weird, weird geek when I was in high school and when I was in college. And then I started showing people my drawings. Then I got respect and they go, you drew that, you weird thing. I learned how to sell my work. But I'm seeing too many kids get labeled Asperger's or autistic or ADHD and they get in kind of a handicap men mentality. And they're not learning work skills. That needs to start at around 13. Maybe walking dogs for the next door neighbors. Something really, really simple. Now, I used to joke around that I had a huge graphic cir uh, circuit in my head. Turns out that I do. It's probably in the top 25%. And then I had a lot of fun with Walter Snyder at the University of Pittsburgh. And I got to thank our Defense Department for funding this research. Originally, it was funded for head injuries in soldiers. And I was one of the first people with autism to get to try out the new technology. This was strictly scientists playing with the latest new equipment. And that is a normal cable bundle for speak what you see. Myelinated fibers that go from the uh, visual cortex up to the language part of the brain. That's a normal one. That's mine. I got a lot of extra bushes. Now, if you went out and you scanned 100 people, at what point is an extra branch abnormal? There's no black and white dividing line. It is a continuum. Now, I paid a price for that. I have less fibers for speak what you see. And that probably explains why I had speech delay. I was a severely speech delayed kid. But then there's other kids that are just geeky and nerdy and socially awkward. They used to be labeled Asperger's. Now in 2013, they changed the guideline. They put them all together. I had lots of fun spotting the Asperger's around here. I've been to other companies here in Silicon Valley. So one geek gets to go to the fun places, and another geek is playing video games on Social Security. No, that's not where we need to be getting these videos out there. You've got to cut through the bureaucracy. I've got to tell you about a sign that I've got at home. 20 years ago when fax machines were really popular, I got this fax. It must have been in 100 fax machines because it was all covered with spots. And it was about administrating. And what is the heaviest element known to the human race on the periodic table of the elements? It's administratium. And it has a super astronomical atomic weight. <laughs> and it reacts with absolutely nothing because it's inert. <laughs> <coughs> That's administratium. Well, now you're going to see the hole in my math department. You see, a lot of kids that are kind of different are good at one thing. So I've got really good abilities in visual thinking. But my left parietal area is trashed out. I've got very bad working memory. That's why I can't do algebra. I also tried to take programming, Fortran, and that was like useless. And uh, Bill Gates and I had access to this exact same computer when it first came out, and he could do it, and I couldn't. I don't agree with Malcolm Gladwell. He doesn't think innate ability matters. Yes, you have to practice. Yes, abilities have to be developed. And you've got to learn how to do tasks other people want. And you have to have access to the services. Yes, Bill and I both had that. He could program, I couldn't. I could turn the computer on, and that was about it. Now I want to give you a glimpse into the pattern mind. This praying mantis is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. And what you see in the background is the folding pattern. 
And I want to thank you, Jessica. You found me better slides than the one I had. I'm going to keep this slide. You know, this right here is an example of pattern thinking, more extreme kind of paper stuff. Now, when I asked a physicist who did work on the Hubble Space Telescope to think about a church steeple, he saw motion of people swinging and singing and praying. Now, you got two ways to teach the math. I can teach it more verbally or teach it more visually, spatially. Education is really bad about getting into fads. OK, we're going to teach reading with phonics. We're going to teach reading with whole word. You know what matters is the outcome. I spent 20 years supervising steel and concrete construction work in my facilities. I would design a job, then I'd supervise its construction, then I had to start it up. And in education, we need to be thinking a lot more about finishing a job. And I want to see those smart kids that ought to be here getting a job here, getting a job at Google, or getting on, get to play with that helicopter over there that I got to see that probably was uh, flying you know, by itself. That's very cool. And here's more evidence, a brand new study on the different types of visualizers. Yes, we need evidence-based. OK, let's start looking at different ways to look at thinking. You can have more associational thinking. It's more like me. That's how I could get from an Ariat boot to a mud puddle. Now, you don't really see the relationship there. But when I explain the relationship, it's not random. A word thinker is more linear. But you need the word thinkers to get organization to get things done. And I've read some of the stuff about tech companies. They get to be a certain size, they're going to have to get a few suits. Otherwise, they just turn into a disorganized mess. Pictures and patterns versus words. Bottom up versus top down. I'm getting worried about a lot of young people today getting too separated from the world of practical things. They don't cook, sew, woodworking. They don't know how to fix a lamp. So everything becomes totally abstract. I think that's a worry, a real big worry. You can be social or more or less social, more social. It's a continuum. You can, and when you, don't, when you do bottom-up thinking, it takes a lot more time to get the data. But when you do too much top-down thinking, you tend to grossly overgeneralize. They go, oh, my kid's Asperger's, or my kid has autism. Well, if he's three years old and not talking, I can give you a standard answer. 20 hours a week of intensive, ther 20 intensive therapy. But let's say the kid's eight years old. Does he talk? What does he do? I've got to have a lot more um, specifics on him. People tend to overgeneralize. Oh, thank you, Jessica. That's a beautiful mixing board. I'm going to add this to my permanent slides. Because this really illustrates the idea that complex traits, like how much anxiety you have, how much visual thinking you have, how fearful you are, a whole lot of, you know, how much of a mathematician you are. It's like a mixing board. It's a continuous trait. All right, what would happen to these people today? How about little Stevie? Little Stevie was a weird loner who brought snakes to school and turned them loose. And how about little Albert? Albert had no language until age three. What would happen to little Albert today, especially somewhere far away from here? This is where you've got to broaden your horizon, way outside of here. You know, where's Einstein, too? He's probably in the basement playing video games on Social Security. This is the problem. I'm seeing too many smart kids getting labeled autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. Now, the problem you've got with autism is maybe about 25% of them are very severe. They have difficulty, they don't talk, and they have difficulty with you know, just the most basic daily living skills. But then there's probably about 50% of the kids that are being put on the label today where some of them could be working here or some other high-level kind of job. But they're not getting the social skills training when they're young to do that. I'm worried that our educational system is screening out too many kids. You know, every kid that's hyperactive, you know, get them loaded up on drugs. Mother used to say to me, go outside and run the energy out of you. That's what she used to say. Well, Fortune magazine had a great, great, um, article about 10 years ago on dyslexic CEOs. You know, a whole bunch of dyslexic CEOs because they had division. And the head of JetBlue had ADHD. He's been real public about it. And, uh, you know, very good on selling the idea, not so good on operations. Had a real mess at Kennedy Airport when it snowed. See, this is why you need the different kinds of minds. And the head of IKEA is dyslexic. 
And let's look at some examples of different kinds of minds working together as great teams. Steve Jobs was an artist. He didn't do any programming. He got infatuated with calligraphy. He made the interface for the iPhone. So every time you look at that interface on your iPhone, that was made by an artist. Then the engineers had to make it work. And there's a fascinating article about the first demonstration of the iPhone. And he had to do it just right or it would freeze and crash. And then the engineers had six months to make it work. Yeah. How about the Fukushima nuclear power plant mess? When I found out why they had this mess, I just couldn't believe it. It was a visual thinking mistake. And what I've learned is that the engineers did not see. Yes, you're next to the sea, and you've put all your emergency generators and emergency cooling pump in a non-waterproof basement with no watertight doors. And if they had had simple watertight doors, it would not have happened. That's something that I have no problem seeing that. All right, I want to see how you guys do on the Texas A&M engineering ethics question. I tell you, I'm very proud I passed this. This is from Karen Watson, provost at Texas A&M. You are the manager of the Boeing aircraft factory. The heavy tool is dropped on the wing of a partially built airplane. It is stressed close to the critical limit. What do you do? All right, don't overthink this one. I had the answer like that. What do you do? You do what? Replace it. That's the correct answer. You replace all the stressed parts. Now, the worst answer that I heard was one government scientist said, you document it. <laughs> I am not kidding. And another worst answer I got was, you prop it up. I go, really? You prop it up? Now, she purposely didn't say, would you fly on that airplane? She said, what would you do? It was deliberately left open-ended. Good. You got the answer right. That's great. That's wonderful. I'm worried about kids getting too separated from practical things. And I was recently at our animal science meetings, and there was some survey data given out to consumers about issues with animals and stuff like this. And, and a lot of younger consumers today, factual information is getting less important. Well, I, thought, I don't think they're getting enough scientific training and hands-on training, and I think that's one of the reasons why that's starting to be a problem. I think it's a worry. I think taking the skilled trades out of the schools is the worst things the school ever did. Hands-on stuff, cooking, sewing, woodworking, welding, all of those things, art, making stuff, teaches practical problem solving. Sometimes your project doesn't work, and then you have to figure out how to make it work. I mean, that's what you did in these wind tunnels. You had to figure out how to make a lot of stuff work. But if you've never done practical things as a kid, you don't understand that. And here's the things that saved me as a kid, hands-on classes. I was bullied and teased in school. And the only places I was not bullied and teased was things like horseback riding and model rockets. And my science teacher, uh, Mr. Carlock, had the model rockets club. He also had an electronics lab. And these are things that just absolutely saved me, specialized things, other really great things, things like, you know, agriculture classes. And too many schools are taking this stuff out. Now, there's a few schools that are learning to put this stuff back in. I get asked all the time, how did you get interested in cattle? I was exposed to them when I was 15. We've got to be hooking these teenagers. We also need to be hooking them in middle school. I want to find cool things I can find online on YouTube where I don't have to troll through an impossible to navigate web page <laughs> where they'll just pop up on YouTube. Khan Academy just started out as a little tutoring thing for their own kids. Then they found out more people were getting on it. You've got to get those kind of things going. Well, I want to give all the teachers out there, because I've done this talk for businesses, I've done it for teachers. You better have a little respect for the skilled trades, because when you take the covers off the jet engine. It's a pretty complicated thing. People don't realize that. There's a shortage of people right now to fix airplane engines and to fix cars. You know, young people are concerned about things. Then young people do want to improve society, but they don't really know how to do it. They haven't been given enough tools 
just to learn how to problem solve in the practical world. And the practical world is going to be messy. It's not going to fit all the theories. And students are getting further and further away from the farm. 31% of young students have never been on a farm. 50% of uh, young adults have never been on a farm that raises animals. They're getting totally separated from where their food comes from. You've got water shortages here. I heard on the radio the other day, oil drilling equipment was used for drilling water wells. I mean, we've got to go that deep. These are the sort of little bits and pieces I put together, and I go, wait a minute. That's not a good thing to hear. Well, here's 50% of young adults in the UK couldn't connect pigs with bacon. <laughs> I go, really? They don't know where stuff comes from, all kinds of stuff. And there's a great farm outside of Chicago where you can go visit a big dairy and you can go visit a real pig farm. And the most common weird question they get is, are those actually pigs? <laughs> yeah, are they Disney animatronic pigs? No, they're not. They're real pigs. I'm worried as people get more and more into the mobile apps, getting worse and worse getting into their silos. I talked to a young 22-year-old about two weeks ago that did not know what regular Google searches are. I think that's a real problem. And in this survey that was done by one of our um, agriculture organizations, they're what they call it the tribalization of communication. I call it getting in the silos, where you just talk to like-minded people. You know, our generation, you know, you'd listen to the national news and a wide bunch of different people listen to it. But I'm worried about um, kids where they're getting into two, just a real narrow uh, thing. The other big problem on the internet is it magnifies the voices of radicals on both sides of an issue. We got to work on taking down the silos. And originally, I wanted to just have a picture of busting up a silo. And then I found this picture of chewing it down. And even with a hydraulic chomper, it's a lot of work to chew down the silos. You guys have got to get out of the silo. Yeah, you're going to need it for funding. You got to do it. You got to like kick a hole through administratium and you got to just do it. I got interested in optical illusions because um, in a science class, I was shown an old Bell Labs movie. And in the HBO movie, they show the original Bell Labs movie that I saw. That was an example of showing kids interesting stuff. There's one of my designs done in SketchUp. And SketchUp's a free program you can get online. There's all kinds of great free stuff online. A lot of teachers just don't know about it. Yeah, you know, and then I could print it out on a 3D printer. That would be pretty cool. In fact, um, the MakerBot um, had a sign on there that said, warning, patience. I hope this is a MakerBot printer. This is one of the substituted slides I had a slide originally of the MakerBot from the MakerBot web page. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a MakerBot product or not. But the thing that I really liked was they talked about patience. You got this little glue gun thing, and the little thing itself is not electronic. It's controlled electronically. It's a mechanical device. It goes back to the messy physical world. Well, that's the end of my talk. And what I hope I've done is I've helped you make you think now I want to have some really good questions. Thank you, Temple, for an excellent talk. We have time for some questions. If you have a question, please stand and go to the aisle in front of the mic and ask one question. Be succinct, and we'll get as many answers, uh, replies. Thank you. Oh, well, good, we've got one already, and if we don't have any more, I'll pick somebody. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, earlier in your talk, you mentioned that uh, you've observed that kids more often have visual thinking. Um, little kids especially. Little kids especially. I was interested in that because that would seem to indicate that uh, modes of thinking change from childhood to adulthood. See, as you go to adulthood, you're relying more and more on language. Uh -huh. And the thing that was really shocking for me, and I discovered this back when I was doing my book, Thinking in Pictures, that was 20 years ago, when I asked this speech therapist, think about a church steeple, and she goes, pointy thing like that. I just see specific pictures. Now, most people, if I ask them, think about your house or car, you can see your own house or car. You see, and I'd, been, and I'd made the mistake of asking something they were very familiar with. 
But when I ask you something that's out there in the environment, everybody sees them, but they're not quite so familiar with it. That's when, the, when a lot of people tend to get just sort of a vague, pointy thing. And that was a real sudden bunch of insight to me that my thinking was really different because there is no pointy thing. I can fabricate in my mind a pointy thing. I have a slide that I found from a plastic church steeple company of a pointy thing, but it's something I have to fabricate. You know, I tend to see ones around Fort Collins. I tend to see the slides that I use. You know, and those slides gave me a whole pile of viruses in my computer <laughs> <coughs> of some specific churches in Fort Collins. Um. So I, I guess a specific question that I have is how uh, the plasticity, I guess, um, for, the, for the brains and the different types of thinking, would, um, would you say that kids are better at switching um, between different modes of thinking or Little adults? Little kids tend to be more visual have, thinkers. Thanks. But it's, you see, there's a lot of plasticity. All right, let's sort of look at the music mixing board. Um, maybe there's a screw put in part of the slot and you've got plasticity, you know, within that range. And when it comes to see, the reason why I'm so bad at algebra, I got no working memory. I can't, if I have to, let's say I had to take apart the McDonald's uh, ice cream machine and clean it, I'd need to write down the steps and then I'd keep it in a card in my pocket for maybe two weeks and then I'd get it memorized. And when I worked in a dairy, they had a little piece of paper on the wall, five steps or eight steps for setting up the milking equipment. I would have been in trouble without that cheat sheet because I do not remember more than three sequences. But if I have my cheat sheet, then I'm fine, because then it's like keywords on Google. Boom. I, and, I'm, and I see the pictures for that step. Boom. I see the pictures for the next step. You know, that's how I can work around that. But you need the visual thinkers to prevent messes like Fukushima. When I found out why that burned up, I'm going, you've got to be kidding. And then the second mistake was cultural. They never asked for help. How could you sit there and watch that thing burn up? All you had to do is pick up the phone, and they didn't do it. Any piece of equipment you want, you could have it there. The world would be there to help you. No, that's sort of beyond me. No, at that point, nuclear reactors melting down. You pick up the horn because you've got to stop breach of containment. That's so horrible, you can't let it happen. Okay. Hi, I'm currently a high school teacher for chemistry, and I was wondering if you had any advice on identifying students' strengths in the beginning of the school year, so that, because I like the idea of grouping different types of minds ooh, to better work together. Well, normally, strengths start to show up. My ability in art, which was really encouraged, started to show up in third and fourth grade. That'd be like seven, eight years old. And, and then also, that's the same age that mathematics ability often shows up. And what you want to do with those kids, if that eighth grader can do high school math, let him do high school math. He's going to need help in reading. You know, what, first thing you find out is what are they good at? Now I'm seeing too many kids totally getting addicted to video games. I was really interested to read that the head of Twitter is severely limits uh, that sort of activity because he wants his kids uh, going into something more worthwhile than playing video games all day. Uh, if the kid gets exposed to enough different things, you know, a lot of kids really are good at building things with Legos. It's the only building thing they get exposed to. They're good at building Legos, let's expose them to a lot of other things. Maybe building organic chemistry molecules, models, something like that. Uh, you know, some kids are really good at math, others are horrible at math. The visual thinkers, I had a terrible time balancing equations, but doing chemistry experiments was really interesting because they don't always come out perfectly. That's the real world. I hope that your school is still doing hands-on labs. Good, <laughs> because there's some people think you can do chemistry lab online. I'm going, no, there's some things you need to do. You need to actually do the real thing. Thank you. Hi, so um, I read your book, Unwritten Rules of Social Relationships, and I thought, wow, that was really useful. And I, I went over, went through it with my son, and I thought it was very useful for him. And, and actually... Your son? I, um, well, right now he's 19. He's 19. How's he doing? Uh, that's a long story. Long story? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thanks for asking. We can, we can talk offline if you like. Okay. But I, I really wanted to talk about something else. Um, 
uh, so the, uh, I thought, you know, I wish I'd had that book around when I was younger. And I, I, in fact, I wish, I think a lot of my colleagues would find a lot of benefit from it. Oh, I think there's That's a it. lot of people yeah. here that are on the spectrum. And why are they here? Because in the 50s, they pounded in the social rules. 50s and 60s, kids were taught table manners, taught how to shake hands. I had to be hostess at my mother's parties and learn how to greet guests. Also, they used teachable moments. Like if I was um, going to eat the mashed potatoes with my hand, mother would say, use the fork. She didn't scream no. She would simply give the instruction. And the whole social rules thing was taught in a much more structured manner. So the kid that was just kind of mildly a little bit on the autism spectrum, maybe kind of Asperger type of kid, they learned enough social skills so they could get a great job at NASA. Yep. So my question is actually not for you. My question is for the management here. Are, are you aware that unwritten rules of social relationships would really be a very beneficial yeah, to most of the population here? Put it in your library. And the other yeah. thing I've found, a lot of technical organizations, is there's tons and tons of autistic grandchildren and, you know, it's a music mixing board, a little bit of the genetics gives an advantage, then you put two of them together, you well, I used to, put more yeah. of the little snips, like little variations in the genetic code in there. Yeah. And um, I also found an interesting paper on schizophrenia, where a little tiny bit of that trait makes creativity. That's why these traits have remained in the population, because in the small amounts of them, they enable us to go to the moon mm -hmm. or to do some great art. Too much of it, yes, then you've got a gigantic handicap. Well, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, Temple. As you were describing um, your own experiences, I felt you were describing my son. He's also a visual thinker, and he has autism. I guess my question is, how did you overcome your um, limited language challenge? You, are, you, you said you had language challenge when you were a kid. Well, I... I um, I got into very good early intervention. I can't emphasize enough, if you've got a three-year-old that's not talking, it's 20 hours a week of intense one-on-ones. That, I can give you a standard answer. Once kids get older, I've got to know a lot more about them because they've made the autism spectrum so broad now. I'm, you know, mainly you got to, the, well, well, my older ones, we need to go back to the 50s style of teaching social rules. And they've got to be just taught. I learned a lot on greeting guests at my mother's parties. Yeah, because what I found was the language, um, having limited language uh, leads now? to... I'm sorry? Okay. He, he's 10. He's 10. You see, this is where when we get further along on the spectrum, I have to have much more detailed information. See, people are grossly overgeneralizing just on the word autism. The 10-year-old, I want to get level of speech. How's he doing in school? <coughs> There's a lot more things that I've got to know before I can give you an answer. I can only yeah. give a standard answer when it's a three-year-old with no speech. Then I can give you a standard answer. Okay, we'll talk offline. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's interesting to see your perspective, like how you, you're describing how you were learning things or how you were associating. Um, yeah, you see, the visual thinker yeah. tends to be much more associative. You know, a very verbal thinker, it's much more linear. And one of the big problems I'm seeing today is I'm seeing a lot of smart kids that ought to be ending up here or ending up on, I saw that the helicopter over there that was probably flying by itself, you know, working on something like that. And they're ending up in the basement playing video games. You see, I've made a point in my career to go between the silos, do a certain amount of tech talks, cattle talks, purely autism talks, uh, uh, talks to business people, going between the silos. It's not easy doing that. So you say exposure is really important. Well, but you've got to expose kids to interesting things. But now, like I said, unfortunately, if you have a child that maybe is there's the problem you've got now with the autism label, is you're going with a huge variation. I wouldn't suggest uh, you've got somebody that's nonverbal that um, can't read. Uh, they're not going to work at NASA. You see, but the problem is, is that they've made the autism spectrum so wide. You see, if you get labeled dyslexic, you have trouble with reading. ADHD, you have trouble with attention. You see, those labels are a much narrower label. But I'm seeing kids that in my generation were just labeled geeks and nerds. Um, and they ought to be going on in these kinds of jobs. And there's a tendency lots of times for the parents to overprotect. 
I was at the airport the other day, and my plane was delayed. So I got talking to a family that had a teenage kid that was very good at animation. And he was just being in his bedroom. And I suggested that he needs to get out and video, do some other people's video. And the mom didn't want to let go. And I said, and there was an opportunity for some video editing just a mile down the road that he could do. I said, you've got to let him go and work on this other video editing. He's got to learn how to do video editing that other people want. Biggest problem I'm seeing with a lot of these really smart kids is they're not learning how to work. I mean, the first sign painting job I ever sold was for a beauty shop. I had to make a sign that they wanted. Mother arranged a sewing job for me when I was 13, and when I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. I learned how to work. That's another big problem I'm seeing with a lot of kids. But before I could make a recommendation to you, I'd have to, I've got to like ask you a bunch of questions to find out exactly you know, what he's capable of doing. And, and I, I'm not capable of doing computer programming. I tried it. I was exposed to it. Didn't work for me. It worked for Bill Gates. He and I were on the same computer in the same year. So in an ideal world, a good teacher will be able to cover all the different types of thinkers in a classroom. But in the real world, time and resources are restricted. So I'm wondering if you could shed some light on how you can accommodate other types of visual think thinkers to learn successfully in a classroom that is not teaching their thinking type. Well, I think classrooms ought to be using more of a variety of methods. All right, let's take something simple like teaching reading. You know, basically you can teach it with phonics, and I was a phonics learner. Dick and Jane books were useless for me. Other kids are a whole word learner. So you introduce it both ways because your end result is I want them to be able to read. And as soon as mother started teaching me with phonics, I went from the thir third grade, first grade level of reading up to sixth grade level in like two and a half months. I, your end result is you want the kid to be able to read. You want the kid to be able to find the area of a circle or whatever thing you want to teach. You know, you, you use, education gets really bad in top-down fats. So what saved me on getting through college? Because when I went to college, uh, algebra was not the national required class. It was finite math, which was matrices, probability, and statistics. And with a whole ton of tutoring, I was able to do that. If it had been algebra, I would have just been sunk. You know, I think what they need to do on this math requirement is allow substitution of maybe algebra with geometry. Because there's a lot, and I never got a chance to take geometry. That was a gigantic mistake in my education. Also, I understand a lot better with specific examples. When I had to be tutored in statistics, okay, we're going to do a t-test, so we'd make up some data for a simple experiment on feeding cattle two different kinds of feed and seeing if there's differences in weight. That's for a t-test. You know, I had to use a specific example of an experiment I could totally understand, you know, on how to use each different statistical test. And then understanding things like discrete and continuous variables. I used to love to drive the statistics teacher crazy. I said, what do you do with a truck scale that weighs in five pound increments? That's not continuous. Weight's usually a continuous variable. OK, all right. So please, please join me in thanking Dr. Temple Grandin for an excellent talk. OK.